Creators Game, episode 13. I'm Daya Miller. Jay Smith. Chris Vale. And uh, we got a lot to talk about, and uh, we're just going to get right into it. What did everyone think of the Linden Hill interview last week, and did you get any feedback from the community? Because uh, on my on my part, like a lot of community, community members were like, oh, it was really cool what you guys did. Uh, it was really great to have like these young players. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the a lot of the people were like, oh, yeah, like you're having these young players up, and we're going to get to see them grow. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was some of the feedback that I got. I just wanted to know if you guys had got anything back from the community. Mm -hmm. I know, I know I really enjoyed the interview, and I thought we learned something new. It was a really fun time, right? And I look forward to watching him hopefully play this year for Ottawa and wish him all the best. Um, I had a, a couple people were just like, you know, cool interview. But Lyndon's well-spoken. Spoken. He's well-versed. Um, he The interview kind of kind of just flowed because of him. But um, Chris is right. It is, you know, we got young guys. It'll be good to watch him grow. It'll be good to watch his words help grow this game. Um, because he, he said quite a bit that you wouldn't expect out of a young guy just hit 21 years old. He's mature beyond his years. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm uh, noticing. Even like Thunder, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, sometimes I don't know the players. I'm just meeting them. It's the very first time. But the way they open up and the way that they're, uh, you know, conversating, it's very respectful. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's what I like to see out of uh, some of our players here on Six Nations. Who are some of the players that you would like to see on the show? If you guys, you know, since we're uh, talking, like we're talking about, you know, young players, who would you want to see on the show? And this is a good time to shout out some of those players who are doing some really good things right now. And like Jay said before, I think like a Thunder, a Linden, very professional for being so young and, you know, just getting now into media mm -hmm. and interviews mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So both of those guys will have great careers coming up in summer and in Pro Bowl. Well, we had we had Dale, too, and I think Dale's, Dale, young, yeah. Dale's younger yeah, than, those, than those guys. Still has another whole year of junior it's, left. He's a little more quiet, but, yeah. I mean, he's, he's still a good kid. A, a player that I would like to have on the show, off the top of my head, young player or, or does it matter? Any player, like just um, someone who do you think – like um, some, sometimes what I like to do is to reach out to the players who, again, might be quiet, but you just kind of want to pick their brain. You yeah. want to be like, yeah, I want to know what's going on in your mind. You're a great player. I don't get to hear enough from you. Uh, I, I got to uh, sit with um, DeHogan Nanakok at the Chiefs game, one of the Chiefs games. And um, I think it'd be cool if we could get him on the show because he's uh, I've watched him grow. He's he's actually Thunder's uncle. Um, I, I would love to get him on the show because we've watched him grow. I mean, we didn't have stuff like, like this podcast when he was growing up, but we've watched him grow up in front of our eyes and become the player that he's become. Uh, another local player. Um, I'd like to see, I'd like to see somebody from maybe, maybe they're not quite at junior A or junior B yet. I'd, I'd like to get maybe some of our, some of our guys coming out of minor into junior or they're on the cusp of cracking the rebels like somebody from a junior c team or something there's even been guys that have left at that level and played elsewhere um my own son owen for example he he left um this the stealth in junior c and went to, went to wilmot and they treated him like gold and at the junior c level wilmot is one of our biggest rivals they're almost you know there's there's almost the 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 level of hate to say hatred but the 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 levels there as far as competing against Wilmot the same as it ha always has been with Brampton and Orangeville and Whitby and St. Catharines when it comes to Six Nations Lacrosse so I would like to see players that have left and and played or or even more players that have came here to get better one comes to mind uh Jack Biro he played for the Stealth last year didn't he or would he play for the Rebels uh he played for the Rebels this, this year. Yeah, and now he's 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 off he's off to school. Yeah, is he doing Mohawk College? I I saw a post where he's gone. I'm not sure, but that's the other thing too. Mohawk College is yes. the first college in Canada to have a field lacrosse team. Yep, they're they're, all the other ones are universities, and they're doing sixes lacrosse, so not even traditional field. So, like I said, they, they want Mohawk College really wants to grow the game. They really want players from this area, Burlington, Hamilton, and especially Six Nations. The athletic director there, he's really, uh, he's really pushing it. They got Andy Secor. He's native. He's, I believe, he played arrows, coached arrows, Iroquois Nationals at the time. Um, Wasn't he on the bench with Halifax too, or yeah, Rochester? Uh, Rochester, yep. Yeah. And then uh, I think he got hurt, hurt his knee, and then that's when he kind of got more into coaching, and then. 
there was two, uh, two other guys, two as assistants. Uh, one guy, I think he played for Robert Morris, a Hamilton guy. So, like, they're actually paying coaches and, like, trying to really grow in that. It's not Kufla. It's kind of their own mm-hmm. college and stuff like that. And they hope to kind of get Niagara College involved. And also, they just played, I guess, McMaster. And they're, they're trying to set up some games this uh, inaug- inaugural fall season for them. So, mm-hmm. And uh, what is, for everyone listening, what is the sixes lacrosse? Or what type of style of lacrosse it's is that? Kind of like if field and box had a kid, it's sixes because it's like five on five field goalies. They move the field in. And really just fast pace up and down. Like it's supposed to be in the Olympics in 2028. So it's it's outdoor lacrosse, but instead of the countries having to bring 40 man rosters and regular field lacrosse and spend all this money, they just kind of made a faster pace, smaller game to get it in the Olympics. So and now it's really taken off. And Ontario, even minor field, has a big sixes program now. And everything for women and in. Um, men's lacrosse and then they just played in Alabama two years ago mm-hmm. had a, the first games of that so it's really still something new even that I'm like really trying to learn it's just another new lacrosse thing right we say lacrosse has so many rules and it's got to be new if Chris doesn't know about it yeah yet. Oh, all the rules like I was saying <laughs> we were talking about like I guess there's some contact rules I was talking with the Mohawk guy earlier today and like I said I was like I gotta re-, like you said something new right I watched some of those games but then even just those little those little rules right there's just not traditional lacrosse does Jagger Miller play for the Mohawk or team is it Jagger? Uh, was there Lucas? There was another gentleman. I think he's from maybe from Milton, and he plays Rebels on them. And then uh, Eddie Cuomo, the Swarm. His kids, their goalie. I'm trying to think of. And I think they're, yeah, Jagger Miller. Yeah, that. Yeah, I think he was in that commercial too. They had a nice little commercial. Yes, so. that's his older brother is Josh Miller. Mm-hmm. Josh Miller used to be used to be captain of the Rebels. Noggin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Everybody knows him as Nog or Noggin. Um, Another great young guy. He's mm-hmm. he's in his he's in his mid twenties, late twenties. Um, he'd be good to have on the show too, just because he's he's had that leadership role with the Rebels, and as far as I know, he's went back to even help coach them now. Speaking of which, do you got your coaching application in for the Rebels? No, I did not. But oh, uh, are you stepping up? No, are you, no, are you no, going to no. be coaching? No, you, no, you no, got no, your no. Halloween. Oh, all right. Ooh. Uh, younger player wise, Nick Thomas. He's another good player. Uh, Cambridge captain. I think he's going to St. Catharines Junior A this year. He's kind of played all over and done a lot of stuff. And he, even for him being young, having another year of junior left. And how about Rolando Henderson? Yeah, yeah. another came, played Cambridge this year. Ro- Rolo's from here. Um, the style of play he plays. He's one of those guys where you love to have him on your squad, but hate to play against him. He went to Cambridge. Cambridge eventually beat out the Rebels. So he would be. Um, I won't say controversial, but I'll, I would say high profile to have him on. It'd be great. One player, he's not originally from here, but he played Iros Chiefs. He played for Allegheny this year. He plays for Albany. Leo Sturros, I reached out to him, but he was busy at the Worlds playing for Team China. I seen he scored a goal, and I'm hoping when he gets back, I see him look like he was at Colgate, his alma mater today. So <laughs> hopefully we can get him on the show. He just is in Kitchener, Cambridge area. I was talking to him. I said it would be nice to get him on because he also runs Spartans lacrosse. So, like, he does a lot of training and stuff in the Kitchener area. And then he also Everest, and he's Coach Laurier. So he's done a lot of stuff besides playing to grow the game as well. Filthy plug coming up. Leo scored with a stick strung by Smith lacrosse. There we go. Oh, there we go. So you're not going to be coaching? No, no. <laughs> Why not? Have you, ever, have you ever thought about getting into coaching? Yeah, yeah. I've done that before. I coached uh, Greenville Academy. I helped out a little bit with the minor uh, field a couple of years ago, but I'm not going to coach Rebels or nothing like that. Like, um, I'm all right, though. Like I, I like helping kids and doing stuff, but maybe help out minor or some field thing coming up. That would be cool. This actually leads into uh, one of my questions that I had. Uh, we do have our board in front of us today. I am on, I'm going to try to stay on track. Maybe not uh, can you the way that it's... Can you even read that? Oh, yeah, I can oh, read that. Good, because I can't. Well, yeah. I can read it. <laughs> well, my, well, one question I wanted to ask both of you guys is, uh, like, what is your end goal for lacrosse? Like, you know, none of us here are going to, like, jump in on the floor and go pro. That's a fact. I'm sorry, guys. None of us what? are going to go pro. Yeah, I thought I still a shot. We're, yeah, we're, none of us are going to go we're pro. We're done here. <laughs> yeah. we're, none of us are going <laughs> pro. But what is the end goal for you guys? Like, if you could be, let's, I don't, I don't even know. I don't want to put an age on it or nothing like that. But, like, you know, at 60 years old, you want to be doing this. Or, like, when you're 70, you want to be doing this. Or you, is there something in lacrosse that you really want to accomplish? Was there ever, like... 
whether it's right now or maybe like when you were like 20 years old, it's like, it was like, oh, I really wanted to do this. Um, for me, the, the goal, which came close this year, um, was to have myself and one of my boys win the President's Cup. We ended up on different squads, you know. If, if you're wondering what happened, go look at the previous episodes, you'll see. Um, the end goal for me, though, isn't really about winning championships. They're a bonus. It's just, to me, it's giving back to, giving back to the community that um, I live in and that where, I, where I'm from. And uh, I told myself I would be on a bench in some capacity for 25 years. Um, next summer will be 24. So do I have two years left? I think I do, but um, I'll call it now because people have said, you won't quit after 25 years. I'm probably not going to quit after 25 years. It, the end result for me is to just help out as, as long as I can. Um, you know, you, you look at younger teams now, like the Rebels, like the Arrows. They want bench staff who are more in tune with the modern game because this game evolves. It changes every two years something new comes along a different style a different this different that comes along um i'm still i guess you could say my coaching style is a little bit out of date but it still works um as far as i know lacrosse ball is still round and the goal is to still score in a in a net and beat the goalie so some of that old school stuff still works like i said i've i've learned from timmy bumberry jason johnson um ron elijah I, f I keep forgetting about ron he i've he's been a mentor of mine he uh, coaches the, the grand river attack right now um my goal is to just give back as much as i can as as long as i can and when i can anymore then uh, i'm hopefully i'll be that guy that gets to walk in any arena if, for the rest of my life and watch games for free. Maybe like Cap. Exactly like yeah, Cap. Cap gets I don't. I won't have the credentials Cap does, but you know, kudos to Capper. I, I like sitting with him every chance I get. So it was good working with him this summer. But yeah, I want to. I want to be able to just stroll in and watch any game I want, like Cap does. Yeah, that's well. I remember when, uh, like, when they made the ILA. Remember how they had those seats and they were supposed to be for like the legends and the elders and all that stuff. Um, I don't know if it's still like that anymore. But like, yeah, like I, I, I would think that like anyone who's played lacrosse for a long time, coach or been a part of the organization at some point would want to be like, yeah, I want my name in the bleacher. And if it's not, I just want a seat that's like I can say that like, yeah, yeah, like I can sit there anytime I want type thing. Having a having a designated seat would be pretty cool because usually I try to get there early enough to stand along the glass. But as I get older, am I going to be able to stand for a, a length of a game to watch? I don't know. Hopefully, but I don't know. I think that we have enough, like, uh, elders and, like, legends in lacrosse on Six Nations that some of those seats in the ILA could be, like, dedicated. Mm -hmm. Like, that the same way cool. that we have benches and different things yeah, like yeah. that. Like, um, like you know, you go to, like, um, national parks and there'll be benches dedicated to uh, someone of signif significance or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, why can't we do yeah, cool you, things like that? I don't know. You can definitely get some players from the 60s to current. Yeah. And mm -hmm. like I said, one thing for me is, like, I always wanted to be, like, a college coach, but... Like I said, some, nowadays maybe something in media, and then I wouldn't mind being like a scout for a pro team or something like that. And just like I said, just giving back or just as being involved as possible. Right? Like lacrosse is one thing; it's you really gotta love it to like really be around it. Right? Like it's and it's. I, I always like football and basketball as a kid, but lacrosse is something that just took over. And I think it's cool that you, you're you're like you said you've you've helped out already. Mm -hmm. You're giving back to a community that you're not even originally from. So to me, that that's even more special, yeah. I think, because you you're you came here, you moved here a few years back, mm -hmm. you're giving back to to this community. Yeah, definitely. I yeah. think it's pretty cool. And like I said, like here, it's like I had my parents were down a couple of weeks ago, and I was showing my dad. I was like, look at all the lacrosse nets and yards, and he's like, that's why, because like you guys are the best around here, <laughs> right? <laughs> like he didn't even know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, like uh, yeah, things like that. Like uh, so, like uh, and like you'd like to do media. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd like to be um, a scout. Yeah. So would you say that, like, uh, have you seen Moneyball? Yeah. Would you be like the Jonah I would, Hill of, like, I would, I would, Moneyball? I look like Brad Pitt, but... I was going to say, I was I like, like yeah, to, you're I Brad, like, you're Brad. Yeah, I would like to do some Moneyball I'll, I'll stuff. Be Jonah. Or, I'll be young Jonah. 
Like I said, yeah, just that'd be cool. Like you said, just because there's so many players in the rough and so many players you see. Like I said, Josh Medeiros, I first seen him playing for Jay's team in Dreamcatcher years ago, and I just like was like, this guy's really good. And then I watched him. Then after that tournament that winter, playing for Paris, and then all of a sudden, boom, Peace Panther City, and now Rochester because they folded. But I was like, this guy's really good. Why isn't he in the league? Like somebody mm -hmm. should sign mm -hmm. this guy. And it's like it's, he's, so many guys are just around and just need a shot. What I what I found is if you see a diamond in the rough and you see something in them, oftentimes it's hard to convince others what you see. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, bang, they're in the show. Somebody saw them somewhere, mm -hmm. but the people that you want it to notice oftentimes won't give a person the time of day. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of underrated athletes here in our community that again may have to leave our community to get noticed. Mm -hmm. And some do. I think I think specifically with our community is we're such a close-knit community that your reputation off the floor can carry you on the floor and it can ruin a lot of chances for you mm. and um it comes with the game it's 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 the game like it comes with life mm -hmm. you know if you want to if you want to be a you know a piece of garbage off the floor you're probably not going to be treated the greatest by the community once you get on the floor like maybe they're not going to cheer for you or maybe they're not going to want you to be a part of that team because something you're a part of outside of within the outside of lacrosse or maybe you treat the uh, your teammates a certain way now your team's not even cheering for you and they don't want you on the team and different <laughs> things like that so yeah. there's a lot of like different characteristics that within this community because it's so small everyone knows everyone and everyone goes to lacrosse games you can just mess up outside of lacrosse and it can totally affect the floor oh for sure um i i often tell people um I, a couple of weeks ago i went to the the men's uh, team australia versus the uh arena lacrosse league arena lacrosse league all-stars and uh somebody high up in the in the all league come up to me and said why hasn't your kid gone pro and i th i feel personally that it's it's affected all my boys across the board because I tell them don't kiss anybody's ass, and so now they've a lot, they've gotten as far as they've gotten. Will they go further? I hope so. But is the is the sins of the father paid onto the sons because I told them not to be ass kissers? I don't know. Yeah, and that's true. Like sometimes you might have to leave the community mm -hmm. because it's like this community's too close in it, and that's just like. Unfortunately, that's just the way of life. It's like everyone wants to see you good, do good, but not better than them. And then uh, not only that, but like when it's such a small community, you're going to have people who want to like use you as like stepping stools mm -hmm. or different things like that and want to move up in the rankings. And in order for them to move up, that means you can't. So well, people will try to just hold you down type of thing. Is in, in certain, but like a, uh, for Joe Blow, who doesn't, who just watched the random lacrosse game and doesn't get all the politics behind it and by politics I don't mean what goes on with an executive or what goes on at an organizational meeting I mean when a coach has to pick his team he can you can only take so many righties so many lefties offense you depending on how you're gonna like some teams will start from the back out so from the goalie out they'll, they may they may overload with, with defensive players and only have a few offensive players but is there a log jam at certain positions of, of course there is Senior C Tomahawks this year had a ton of lefties, hardly any righties. Rivermen, ton of lefties, hardly any righties. Goalies. We just had Lyndon on the show. Lyndon left and went to Aquasusney, Onondaga, and Orangeville. Did he leave because he wasn't good enough for here? Or did he leave because there was a goaltending logjam and he, he wanted to go somewhere where he was going to be able to play? Or did he leave for other political reasons? I, I didn't want to ask him that because... He's very focused on the game. I didn't want him to get his head wandering off. But it's, it's a good question. It's a good question for everybody watching. Why do players leave? Especially, like, you met Lyndon. He's a great kid. Doesn't look like politics has affected him, and I hope it never does. Some kids already have, like Rolando Henderson. Mm -hmm. He's had to leave. The Thomas boy you were talking about, he's had to leave. Is there a logjam at that position? Is it his attitude or their attitude? Is it because somebody don't like their parents? Like you said, we're a small community. So if somebody don't like me, they might take it out on my kids. Does it happen? 
that's for the viewer to decide. And a lot of these guys, too, when they do go off, the cream rises to the top, and they are one of the main players off their off res team or mm -hmm. the other res team. And like you said, goalie, like goalie's got to be one of the toughest, most competitive positions around. There's only one guy in net. You know, you play maybe... You could be the fifth forward, you get in, but if you're the fifth goalie, you're not dressing, right? So it's like, no. you know, like, and like you said, too, even if let's say somebody like Arrows or someone takes a goal, like they're both their goalies weren't from here this year. So then a guy, two goalies from here had to go play junior A somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So then, and then, um, also, just like you said, lefties or righties, and it's crazy now. Almost more teams are getting more lefties when years ago it was always more righties, right? So mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. And then like, oh, we have all these good players. This guy could be better than that righty, but because you have so many lefties, you have to cut them. And then that lesser righty makes the team. It's just how it is, right? Yeah, that, that's exactly how it is. Um, I was talking with somebody that holds a pretty prestigious position in the lacrosse world the other day, and. Um, he said something and he hit the nail on the head. And what he said was, his parents have to realize that their nine-year-old kid may not make it to the NLL. So if their kid has to play on a three-team for a few years, let them. And maybe that kid that's a better kid on the one team, maybe he just says, ah, screw lacrosse and quits. Or maybe he likes skateboarding later on in life, or he may switch, right? Like it's never set in stone of... This Chase, team or this player is going to be there forever. Chase Martin, when he was he was a Bantam three goalie, he's went pretty far. He mm, stuck mm -hmm. with it. Still but, playing today, but that's yeah. what I mean. If your if your child doesn't have aspirations in your eyes of being the next Randy Stotts or Cody Jamison mm -hmm. or whoever, if they're only nine or ten, don't worry about it. Let them play. And that's probably the biggest thing you see nowadays in just youth sports in North America, right, is everybody's got to, you know, you got to singleize one sport. We got to pay all this money. I got to drive you all around the continent pretty much. And it's like your kid still may not make it or he may not be that good. Sometimes people just got to realize, right? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's really more about what they, like, what they learn. It's like the same thing as school. Like nowadays, do I think that school's, like, important? Probably not that important. I think what you learn, the social aspect of school is important. You need to learn how to deal with other people. You need to learn how to talk to other people, work with other people, all these other things and socialize. That's what school is important for. So like even with lacrosse, like whether you're playing or whether you're competing at the highest level might not be the most important thing at nine years old, mm -hmm. right? At nine. Once you get up there older and you're like, hey, I want to start competing, then you're grown. You can make that decision. But yeah, at nine, you can go out there and you just need to learn and have fun. And as long as you're in a safe environment, you're probably going to become a better player in that environment. I was just thinking school is, isn't. School is important, but lacrosse is importanter. <laughs> oh, important, importanter. <laughs> I know you mean, though, like, yeah. even how, like, nowadays of people can be an accounting major, but then they're selling insurance, right? Because it's just the job market and everybody's getting degrees and this and stuff nowadays. And sometimes, like you said, you just need to know how the world works to get ahead in life. Well, like, my point with school was more or less that, like, at nine years old, yeah, right? Yeah. The math that they're teaching you at nine, like you're not gonna use that and go on and be an accountant or something yeah. like that. Maybe you might go, might you might get there, mm -hmm. but again, it's more about that you're safe and you're learning and you're actually like <laughs> talking to other people mm -hmm. because you know? that's like the biggest thing that lacrosse teaches you is how to like live in the real world. Because if someone comes up and bullies you on the floor and you do nothing and you be a little bitch, sorry my language if you're a little <laughs> kid listening right now, but if that's the way you act and then probably in real life. Uh, it's not going to be too great for you. You got to stand up for yourself, and lacrosse will teach you that. I was just thinking about stuff I learned in school, and you know what? Knowing where the cobalt mines are in the Canadian Shield still hasn't affected me. I really don't care. You lost me at cobalt <laughs> and Canadian Shield. I feel like there's no. definitely stuff in sports and team and coaches, mm -hmm. right? Like coaches say, like you know, you want to be a man at the evening. You got to be a man. You got to go to work. You got to go do this. You got to do that. You can't. There's responsibilities, and you got to do it. And that's like something I've taken from sports of coaches and stuff that have taught me in life. Yeah, like even the, like oh, if you don't show up for practice, you don't get to play. It's the same thing as like uh, you don't do your homework, you're gonna do bad on the test, or you might not even get, you might not even make it to the test type thing. You know what? That that whole that whole if you don't go to practice, you don't play kind of thing. Um, I'm big on that in junior. 
Um, in minor, your hands are tied. I used to say that. If you don't come to practice, don't expect to play. Then we get, we paid the same registration, so why can't our kids play? Well, your kid also didn't come to practice, so he didn't learn what we're going to be doing next game. So is it fair to the other 17 kids that were at practice? Well, let me play devil's advocate. Now, what about a child like me who was troubled, who might not have had a ride to practice, or who maybe didn't uh, have the in the stable home to encourage you to get up and go? Oh, see, rolling up the sleeves. Here we go. Um, I understand that, all of that. I've I've had players like that. I I was. I wouldn't say I was that guy when I played later because I only played till I don't know juvenile as they called it back then. Um, I only played in juvie. <laughs> yeah, I only played in juvie. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes for myself, I can't speak for other coaches, um, I would tell them, if you need a ride, let me know. I will get you. Sometimes I'd show up to practice and have six kids with me. Um, and I get sometimes life happens, you emergencies come up, there's illness, whatever, I get that. But for me, if there's consistently the same kid or, or two or three kids that are always missing practice, I'm going to find out why. Or I'm going to want to find out why. If I can corner up a parent and say, hey, like, what's, what's going on? I, you, your, your kid hasn't made practice. Is everything okay? Sometimes it just so happens that they have another kid that had to be got, taken to tutoring. So it was a, a coin toss. Who gets to go where? Stuff like that. I get it, though. There's some that come from troubled homes. There's some that um, maybe the family doesn't even have a vehicle. I get it. As a coach and as a community member, I, tr I tried as much as I could to help get those kids there. Um, there'd be often times when I've, if, I, if I knew a kid didn't have a ride the next day, I'd even say, hey, you know, see if it's okay. Come stay overnight. You can... You can crash over we had five bedrooms in the house so you can crash you can crash one of the rooms there's a couple couches whatever and i would whatever team they were on if they were on owen's team he's my youngest boy i'd be like hang out with owen on he's your teammate anyways and like to me that's just a little bit of team building you know? <laughs> there's a bunch of kids there go pick one <laughs> go be friends go hang out <laughs> like uh Seth Tierney, he's still, I believe he's still head coach at Hofstra. Back in the day, we're at his uh, Hofstra tournament. He's giving everybody a pep talk. His uncle, Bill Tierney, coach, is giving everybody a pep talk. And Seth's like, oh, we look at the kids, not just that score. We look at who picks up the cups of water on mm -hmm. the ground and throws them out. And we're like, oh, yeah, yeah. And we're like, you're looking at who's scoring. And who do they get later on? Jamie Lincoln. What's he do? Get kicked out of Denver. He goes to Hofstra. Kevin Ford gets into some legal trouble with cops. They let him back on the team. Those guys were scoring, right? Like, you know what I mean? They're like, yeah, maybe he's looking for character guys but he's also willing to give some guys second chances mm -hmm. and also willing to see hey if they can play we'll give you that second chance well i've i've seen that too um i've, I've read it actually um some coaches will be like i want to see how you interact with your with your with your dad with mm -hmm. your mom with your siblings i know what you can do on a field or on a floor mm -hmm. that's why you're here in the first place i want to see how you are off the floor and that speaks volumes like who was it? Was it was it Zed? Was it Zed Williams? They were doing a little a little piece on, and he got off the bus and was picking up garbage off the ground. I believe so. Yeah, and like, he's a player too at Virginia. They kind of put him. I think he still played Rebels right that year, but they kind of had him down doing summer classes and try to get him into the college life early, like mm -hmm. in that summer, just to kind of, you're coming from Cattaraugus. They wanted to get him down to Charlottesville, Virginia, and kind of get him settled in early. I remember like guys well, were all talking. A, a big thing for native folks is they get homesick seems to be a lot easier no, def than anybody else. Okay. Definitely realize, right? Because like you, we said, it's a tight-knit community here. But what is it too? A lot of family, right? So it's mm -hmm. like one place where everybody's kind of your family. So even going a little bit further away can be hard for some guys, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, even yeah, like how you're saying, like uh, picking up the cups and different things like that, and like the way you treat your like your your mom and your dad. What I notice is that like yeah, again, all the players that have come on the show, uh, I always think it's important. It's just like the way that you like meet each other, like at least shake someone's hand. Mm -hmm. Every player that's come on the show has done that. And like that, that says a lot because um, some players, like not some players, like just some 
people, not players specifically, but like people, sometimes just don't look people in the face or like just don't even say hello or different things like that. And I feel that again, lacrosse teaches you to do that stuff, that, that you have to go shake hands at the end of a game. Mm -hmm. You have to see these people. You're going to have to go to a banquet at the end of the year with everybody who's on your team. You're going to have to get along with people. So like, that's what I mean with the social aspect of lacrosse is like how important it is when I was comparing to lacrosse in like school and well, stuff. I mean, I got a hug from Lyndon and Thunder. I'm just, just saying. Oh, ain't nobody give me a hug. Jeez. All right. So we got our next topic. Uh, I want to throw it to you. So are we, are we talking the new lacrosse teams? New. In a new league. Well, not a new league. NAMLA. NAMLA. Hmm. So before I jump into NAMLA, I'll, I'll say I remember when I was younger and played lacrosse. Um, the Newtown Golden Eagles were in Zone 9 in the Ontario Lacrosse Association. So they had league games with the rest of us, St. Catharines, Six Nations, Hamilton, Burlington, all these teams that are in Zone 9, Fort Erie. They played against all of us. We went over there. They come over here. They came. They were, they were here. And it was probably some of the best times looking back because it would be a whole day thing. They would bring... I think over there they're called peanut over here. They're paperweight. I don't know why they're what you, whatever now, yeah, you seven, you seven or whatever. Yeah. They would start there and play right up until juvenile or U twenty two as it's called now. So it'd be a day. It'd be a whole day of games. One one Saturday here, one Saturday over there. It was it was great. You know, it was camaraderie. You made friends, if you're old friends, new friends. For some families, there'd be more family coming over that they have over there. It was great. Um, to the best of my recollection, uh, Newtown left Zone 9 and left the OLA, um, I believe it was for insurance reasons. That and, you know, some centers didn't want to play over there on a Tuesday night. Or I don't know if that was actually scheduled, but that some of the whining that I heard, who wants to go to Newtown on a Tuesday night when I got to work the next morning? Who cares? You signed your kid up, go. <laughs> but... NAMLA. NAMLA is a minor organization um, for kids, and it's pretty much like the Can-Am loop, except there's no Ontario entry. Now, there's rumblings here in this community that they're looking for teams to enter that NAMLA league. Um, if I remember correctly, to be accepted, there has to be three teams. So what age groups could there be? Could there be... U9, U11, U13, U11, U13, U15, U13, U15, U17. I don't know. But from what I, from my understanding is if an organization is going to start here to join there, they have to have three teams to be accepted. I don't have a clue what it looks like yet. I don't even know if there's been any papers filled out or signed, or I know it's in the very, very, very beginning infancy stages of it. It might not even go. I don't know. It'll depend on number of, of community interest. That's what it'll depend on. How many players, because it, players last year, families last year started looking for an alternative because Six Nations minor lacrosse implemented house league. So if you were on a one team or two team, you were traveling. If you weren't, you were either in the house league program here or you went to a different center to play. A lot of kids went to different centers to play. And I get it. They just want to play. Their families did what they could to get them on the floor because they just wanted to play. They wanted to travel. They wanted to have, have the, the experience. Um, keep in mind, for a lot of years, this same community wanted a house league program because sometimes our three team and our four team were a little weaker. They might go to a center who only had one team in that age group, and they'd get hammered by 10 goals. So then parents would complain, I don't want to drive all the way to this place to, for my kid to get beat by 10 goals. So why can't we have a house league program? So after years of that, minor lacrosse put a house league program in, and then they were met with backlash that now their kids don't get to travel. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, I commend minor lacrosse for trying. I was on the minor lacrosse board for a lot of years, and how I got on the minor lacrosse board was... I put my money where my mouth was because I was one of the biggest guys that were complaining about everything. 
And one day I was, they challenged me, well, if you think you can do a better job, join the executive and let's see it. So I said, you're damn right I'm going to join the executive. It's a lot of work. I was humbled by the stuff that you have to do behind the scenes. So if anybody has any issues with minor lacrosse, I, I challenge them to join the executive themselves and see. It's not as easy as people think. So this new league starting up or this new organization starting up, again, I don't know what it looks like. If there's enough interest, it will be an alternative for kids to play. But there's so many things that have to have to happen. They have to be accepted. They have to have enough kids to play. You got to worry about things like jerseys, shorts. What's the registration fee going to be? You have to worry about getting releases from the OLA. You have to worry about all of that stuff. So I think when the time comes, and hopefully it is coming very soon in the next couple of days... You know, some people need to get together, put their heads together and, and hammer this out. Um, when I leave here at some point, either tonight or tomorrow, I'm going to be talking to the, the guy that's spearheading it. I don't want to throw his name out there yet until things are in motion um, and bounce all of this off him. And hopefully we can have a, a community meeting like within the next couple of days, hopefully. And I've seen uh, Six Nations... Uh minor lacrosse was even having a call for like uh coaches and mm -hmm. all the new um like i don't know if it was board members or what it was but like they were calling out for like basically support well there's like chris said there's they're starting they started a six a, six, a sixes program for, for fall field there's that there's regular fall field teams there's nobody to coach these teams um a good buddy of mine craig atwood he jumped on the bench for one he originally didn't start the season coaching but he is now um so yeah, there's all of these all of these players that want to play, and there's a shortage of coaches now. Chris, yep, you like coaching field and kids. Yep. <laughs> well, like, you said, like you said, it was kind of tough because uh, last year the U13 team, three team, is playing Lincoln's only team, who's coached by Paul Day of the Philadelphia Wings, head coach at the time, still currently GM, and then his kids out there with all Philadelphia Wings stuff on it, and I guess it was a big team Ontario player, so they just crushed the teams, and, that, and that's where it is tough, because then those guys are like, oh, we beat Six Nations, but it's like, you didn't beat the best team, you beat one of the teams that's still learning and trying, mm -hmm. and they're for fun, but like you said, another opportunity, right, if get some guys out there playing, and mm -hmm. if they can get it going, it sounds like it'd be fun time to go play Newtown and Tuscarora and all those teams, and give guys more opportunities to say, hey, I've got to play for Simcoe or Hamilton, I can come back and play for Six Nations. Well, I think the thing, too, um, what, a lot of, what a lot of people don't realize, um, like Grand River Warriors, um, in the past, we've had teams here on Six Nations that played in the Can-Am League, and they never had... Um, affiliates. Yeah, they never had affiliates that they could pull from. So a Can-Am team, if, if they needed to get two or three players because somebody was hurt or guys had work commitments, they couldn't pull from a junior team in the OLA because they're a different league. So I remember looking into it probably five, six years ago about getting a, a junior team here that would be in the FNLA like the fire is now, our junior B fire. Because to me, if you had the junior team first, then brought in the Can-Am team, now you have a Can-Am team that can pull from a junior affiliate. But I wanted to establish the junior team first. It just so happens that the fire and the warriors were established the same year. I mean, it's great, great idea. Also, if these, if we get, a, if we can get a minor lacrosse organization on, on Six Nations that is part of NAMLA, now that junior team also has affiliates that they can pull from because they wouldn't be able to pull from OLA kids either. So to me, it's a win-win. Players mm -hmm. still get to play. Uh, our Grand River Warriors and our Six Nations Fire have affiliates they can pull from, and it just grows the game. In my opinion, like no whole nother pipeline and yeah. like you know a whole nother full organization, right? Like they can keep playing all the way up till they want to quit playing and then senior, right? But here's one for you. Remember when the OLA put that stuff out there? Mm -hmm. You can't if you go play in this whatever league, you can't come back. You're suspended for two years. Mm -hmm. Are they going to try to do that? Probably, yeah. I, that, yeah, I would, yeah. yeah they're probably, probably going to still try to push it, and like I know they don't like the travel field teams and well, still this and though. That and, if they're going to do that, though, if all of a sudden the OLA says, hey, we're not going to release 60 kids to go play in NAMLA, and if you go play in NAMLA, 
you're going to be suspended in the OLA, kind of like what they did when they tried to start that other Junior A League. Mm -hmm. And the letter they released when they were trying to stop kids from traveling. And that was kiboshed pretty quick. But the point is, they if they're going to do that, yeah. why didn't they do that to the junior team and the Can Am team now? Mm -hmm. So if they're going to try to if they're going to try to fight that, all of a sudden, they should have tried to fight it last year. And like you said, it's tough for them. Like Ole oh, can't really put that ownership on lacrosse. Like lacrosse is lacrosse. Oh, know? they try. Like, I know. I, I <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every that. every year, there's always lawsuits, this and that, or that CLL league always gets. You know, Twitter's always blown up from them, and this guy suspended because he went and coached one tournament, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all that. Like, there's always some drama in lacrosse going on, right? Always, and, always. Yeah. Someone's got to own something. You don't really just have a good game of lacrosse. Someone's got to try to own it. You don't really hear. I know there's probably AAU basketball, but you don't really hear this. And that's what everybody says. Sometimes lacrosse gets in its own way with the politics of things where you don't really hear that in football and some of the other sports. I'm sure things happen, but it almost seems like it happens a little more in lacrosse. Well, I think the lacrosse world's a hell of a lot smaller than, yeah, than, so we, everybody than knows. any other sport, too. Like, it's Yes, it's around the world. It's mm -hmm. global. But it's such a small community. It is. No, definitely. All the other sports have been colonized already, pretty much. <laughs> all right, let's move on here before I get too uh, too sidetracked with all my talk there. <clears throat> all right, so let's get right into the worlds. Now, I know you have been watching. Colonizers. So, so give us the whole breakdown of the worlds. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think it, it's kind of crazy how, like, England can go – you know, lose all three games, but somehow still makes the quarterfinals and now end up being in the semis. They were losing pretty good to Canada earlier. So unless there was a major comeback from when I stopped watching, looks like Canada's in the gold and then they'll play either Hurt or Shoney or USA. I'm really looking forward to that game because I think USA just has a ton of talent. A guy from here also, Jake Henhock, he's the manager GM of USA. So there is a little hometown flavor on Team USA. And then... Uh, like they just had, I think they just, a lot of people were like, oh, this is the best, going to be the best USA team ever. And then they were, they had the upset of Haudenosaunee that never, they never beat Haudenosaunee before, right? And then, uh, but I'm sure Haudenosaunee is going to have that little bit of edge to them. And I think they're going to, they're going to try to come out, and I think they're going to be a little bit more fire. They're, they, didn't, I don't think Hogarth was in the lineup game one. It looks like he's going to. I'm sure he's going to be in the lineup tonight, and I they kind of have that goal chemistry between, between his legs there. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think they kind of had a like. A, I was listening to Mitch Belisles, one of the guys that were doing announcing. He's like. None of these teams really had much practice unless you're the Haudenosaunee team because 13 guys were on the Chiefs. But it was like, I mean, and, and even them too, maybe just kind of, they just, a lot of the 13 guys just won a man cup and then all of a sudden, boom, you got to go to Utica and play in the world. So it's very back-to-back, -back, right? There wasn't much rest or anything in between. But one other thing I thought was cool was like the Worlds was Ireland. I think Australia is really cool because like all those guys, I... I feel like all those guys are really from Australia. There's not really a lot of North American flavor. Like where I'm watching Ireland and Pat Corbett, Burlington guy, he's played Riverman, Snipers, Chiefs. Um, he just played for Ladner. And then um, like just like some a lot of good players and guys from North America are like, hey, this guy's randomly on this team. Like there was a guy, Nick Suits, I know. He just saw him scoring a goal for U.S. Virgin Islands, and he's just, he's from Utica and plays for their teams and stuff like that. And then uh, so some guys, you're just like, oh, Puerto Rico and Jamaica. And then Damon Edwards, like there was a lot of Leo Sturros. There was a steward on China, a big goal for a place for the Seals. So there was just, lacrosse is definitely growing and it's cool. To even I tuned see into a lot one of, of the guys. games, and Puerto Rico was playing, and I think they were getting crushed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and like you said too, it's just like it boxed because we're looking, and I was like, uh, I was just looking earlier in European uh, the Lacrosse Federation. There, there's over th 30 teams that are all not playing box, but there was over 30 countries in Europe that are all signed up for lacrosse. So like, it's definitely becoming a global sport. And then there's new countries and stuff popping up every year. And like sometimes, yeah, it is somebody from North America with some heritage and. They're kind of start spearheading it, but I mean, it's definitely growing. In Australia, they had the guy with the big beard, the righty. He was pretty good, and that was a really good game. Them versus uh, Ireland. There was Germany. 
there were, I mean, like you said, just tons of tons of guys. It was crazy that were from Canada on all these teams. And look at these rosters: there's Mississauga, Burlington, Hamilton. I seen an Ancaster. I think there was somebody from Air maybe on a team I saw, like on Netherlands. Like I was like, this guy's just from up the road, and next thing you know, he's playing for the ne Netherlands. Yeah. So, what would be a wild place for like a, a country to be put in a team or something like that? Like, just a wild country to be having a lacrosse team. There's, like, Uganda and stuff like that. I just had somebody today, they were bringing sticks. They were going over for six months to Africa, and they bought a couple balls and sticks. So just even just people in general just trying to grow the sport globally. And like you said, that's how lacrosse gets – those get, players end up getting paid, and that's what I even – I think NLL-wise where Halifax is growing. Like, just even in Canada-wise, like, Manitoba's got to grow lacrosse and – no, and Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, like once more people are playing and kind of becoming fans of the game is how like, you know, you get eyes on the sport and then that's how the money and that's how it becomes the next NFL or NBA and stuff like that. That, that was kind of like a comment. I was on social media because um, I have my opinions about this world mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've watched not even one whole game. First of all, when you click watch for free and it asks for a credit card number, I ain't, I ain't going to go for that. Yeah. Um, but um, women's, women's worlds, first time ever. And uh, I'm dead set against the way Team Canada is blowing people out. Why? 33-0, right? How are you going to grow the game doing that? Mm -hmm. in, in the inaugural world championships, how are you going to grow the game doing that? They did it to Japan in a scrimmage. How are you going to grow the game doing that? There's, like you said, we still need to grow the game in the prairies. We still need to grow the game in, in the East Coast. Somebody had commented that we're we're Canadian. This is this is our game. And I said, there's those same opportunities aren't given around the world. They're not even given in this country. The same opportunities that these players have that are on these teams, they're not given to everybody, even in this country. So how can you? In my opinion, how can you protect blowing somebody out? That team may not ever come back just to save themselves the humiliation. And there's been, I think, Costa Rica, they were the last in the 2014 field. They didn't come back in 2018. They, they, or last year, right? So some teams, they just get blown out. They shut it down. But also, too, some of those countries, how many of them, like, probably they'll look at some of those box goalies and stuff like that. How much experience do they have, right? Like, so, you know, you're scoring all those goals, but who are you scoring them on, right? Like, exactly. Like, there's no joy in it. Mm -hmm. Like, I had said it earlier, um, I had the privilege of coaching Team Iroquois. I think it was the Bantam division and at the national level, minor nationals. Um, Team Newfoundland was in, and we were told, you know, it, it's kind of a probationary period for them at the time. They're here, they're going to play, um, but it was more exhibition than anything because mm -hmm. this is the first time they were ever at nationals. And there were other provinces blowing them out of the water. Um, we played them, and uh, shout out to the bench staff. There was uh, Shannon Booth and Bear Hill and myself. We told the boys, we're up by 10 goals. There's no need to score anymore. There's no need. Let's pull back, teach these guys. Teach them on the floor. Explain to them what we're going to do or what they should do. Teach them. Like somebody had commented on one of my things and said, Canada is taking the time to teach their opponents before and after the game. All I saw was a social media publicity stunt where somebody was, one of the players was talking to a couple of the other players for a half an hour after the game. That ain't teaching anybody. That ain't growing the game. So to me, I think it's bullshit. So I know what it's like at the national level mm -hmm. to pull the back on the reins, teach these guys. Team Newfoundland bench came over, thanked us. They bought Mary, I can't remember the name of the company at Provincials or Nationals. They used to have the, you could buy the DVD games per game or the whole set. Team Newfoundland bought that DVD of our game against them. They took it back to the dorms. They studied it. They come back and almost beat Manitoba. Manitoba only beat them by one. They even used the hidden ball trick. <laughs> there you go. That's it. And like, I, th I think too, just like, uh, yeah, Jamaica, I think the guy had the whole Bob Marley on his helmet. And some of those teams too, like, some of them have are fully decked out team gloves, customized this. And some teams, you could tell they're just kind of throwing stuff together. Mm -hmm. their, their budget was to get jersey shorts and get us get us to Utica and let's play the game, right? Like, you know, not everybody has the full look. And 
for field wise, I know back in I think it was 2018, people were kind of they said for security reasons being in like Israel and things that go on, but. The USA was mad that they lost the gold the one year, and the next thing you know, they were kind of isolated, where the Haudenosaunee team was giving stuff away, and everybody signing Warren Hill's autograph, getting autographs of Warren Hill, and getting the Thompsons and everybody like that, where Rob Pinnell and Rabel and all those guys are out just kind of in their own case. They didn't stay in the same hotels as the rest of the teams, where you're kind of losing that community or guys of they're not going to get this experience at those guys. They don't live here. So then the fact that they see the guys, they, some of these guys, like was a coaching and stuff like Mikey Powell, they just see YouTube clips and they're just like, Oh, lacrosse. Like, you know, it's, mm -hmm. and that's probably the biggest thing of um, gear. You hear gear and stuff like that of Australia and the European countries. And it's, they want to grow lacrosse, but they don't have the access to the stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, so how does beating them by 30 goals yeah. help? Yeah, definitely. It's just like you and said. Like, sure, I, that last game, how did Sony just, what did they win, 29-4 20, or something like mm -hmm. that? Okay, they blew them out. I get it. And and I was the first one to say, this is not going to come down to goals for, goals against. And and like you said, too, with the Haudenosaunee, when they kind of just blew out the game yesterday, it was like, at least it was a, the quarterfinals. And, like, you could tell, like, I remember Hogarth just kind of laxadaisically just kind of hit the post, and it was like a nice shot, and they were like, yeah, these guys are going kind of half speed now, the announcer said. And then exactly. uh, Trey Deer had a nice catch, and then he went behind the back, and I think it was Stamp was announcing that game. He's like, that was a really nice goal, even, or a shot, even though it didn't go in. He's like, these guys are just going for the prettiest shot award now. Like, they, you could tell they did take – they took some off the, their pedal off the gas, but, I mean, hey, if they're still scoring, they're still scoring. Brookie Muir, he doesn't – Riverman guy, he had a really nice goal from far out. Right? Well, Broker. it's like no different than, uh, like, watching an NBA All-Star game, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. No one's no one's trying to play like hardcore ball. They're actually it's like if we're gonna get a point, we're gonna make it look good type mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And England too, Cam McLeod, he is an NLO goalie, Panther City, I believe he's now in Calgary after the you know dispersal draft, and he's St. Albert. So like they had a good goalie, and it's just tough because not all those players are as good as some of the guys they bring in. Exactly, and again. Yeah, you're right. Quarterfinals now. Now, if you're gonna, if you got, you can't really let your foot off the gas, even mm -hmm. though it only did. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you don't got to do that in the first game of round robin or mm -hmm. the second. If you you know you're gonna blow somebody out pretty early. Like if your first five shots go in, unless a miracle happens, that other team's probably not that strong. So what's the point? What's the point of hammering the pedal 100 miles an hour and winning by 30? I don't see the point. It ain't football. They were like, like, yeah, you said, did they not let up a goal to the women's Canada team? They finally did they yesterday. Finally, yesterday, okay, yeah, it was like 30, like, that was a lot so of And goals. then, no, uh, uh, they play the um, Haudenosaunee tonight at, like, what, 8.30, I think it is? And how, how many British Columbia girls are on that team? Is it mostly just an Ontario six. team, right? So. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, like six, yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, like, it, it seemed like it was a big, like, a lot I mean, of the women's. not taking away anything away from the, from the players' talent. Oh, definitely, yeah, like I said. Um, when you get to that level, you're, you're, doing what you're told to do and so. honestly it was cool too with the women's box because it isn't women's box isn't everywhere right nobody really plays no. women's box in the united states they were all like charlotte north their field and you could tell too by the way they cradle their sticks and stuff but it was cool seeing them the thing like i said about women's box i think on one of our earlier podcasts was it's cool because it's the same rules as guys mm -hmm. right like you know mm -hmm. they're out there they're hitting they're mm -hmm. slashing like you know so like the fact that all these girls are kind of getting the chance to finally hit, right? And and, and women's field is like you know they get black and blue and things happen and it's dangerous. They don't wear gear, so. I said I said to the one guy on social media because he was going on about you know this isn't house league, mm -hmm. um, this is our game, and so I asked him when you say our game, do you mean the medicine game played in the way it's supposed to be or the spectacle that it's become? Mm -hmm. Because this has been the debate and argument for a lot of years when they first put rules in lacrosse, we mentioned it earlier on a different episode, native players weren't even allowed to play originally because they were considered professional. So they took our game, made rules to specifically stop us. And maybe Canada made a version of it, of it for them, but traditionally, it's still our game. It always will be. How mad, so, how mad would Canada be if the women's NHL team beats them tonight? I'd say a little bit of an upset, right? Obviously, they they lost the USA, and then these guys are undefeated and score over thirty goals. But that'd be a big that'd be a big win for Haudenosaunee women's. Well, let's go there. What are the chances of that? I what, think. What does everyone think? I think they're pretty good um, because the women are they're 
they're starting. Yeah, yeah, they've they've been running together for a year or whatever, but they've only had they've had very few games, mm-hmm. like exhibition games. Inter- very few. Um, Some girls didn't even play the. They didn't want to. Yeah, those thirteen guys played Chiefs, right? And things mm-hmm. they're getting paid, and it's part of it. Where some of those girls didn't even play the women's senior A season because they wanted to make sure that they were healthy for yeah. the world. So some of them probably haven't been in real game action in a while. So like what, you said, it was just the nerves of probably playing USA, and then they've had a really good run so far what, this week. Was it Matt Atwood in an in, interview that said, you know, they're they're start they're finally starting to gel? Yep, yep, it was him. So they're they're starting to gel at the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, will they beat Canada? It would be beautiful to see um but canada's gonna know they're in a game now win or lose canada's gonna know they're in a game they're not gonna yeah, have a pushover definitely. like japan they yeah. like we said did these other countries have they played where we know the Hoshone teams played before so you know it should be at least a good game mm-hmm. it's too bad this wasn't live right now i'd be shouting out all those hood and shoulder girls be like yeah get them get them let them oh. know let them know we're here I, I watched some highlights like Ooh, carrie lee vice she, oh, she's a beast yeah. Yeah. She's a beast. Another stick strung by Smith Lacrosse. Right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Carrie Lee Vice sporting a stick strung by Smith Lacrosse. She's just an athlete in general. Yeah. Like team, there is team, not a sport she cannot play. Team Canada I grew women's. Up with her. Yeah. I used to play dodgeball against her. How are you still alive? I don't know. <laughs> team Canada and women's I used to softball. Talk shit. Well, she did it too. <laughs> and well, she would always get me yelled, but like she is an athlete. She I used is. to play oh, dodgeball definitely. against her. She's mm-hmm. tough. She is. Like there's there's a lot of phenomenal the captain, Vaughn Porter. Um, I used to coach Fawn because when she was younger, there was no girls' teams. So she played with the boys. She was the hardest hitter on the league. I, I've, I've said it before on other episodes, but Fawn was. But Fawn is also s- such a sweet, sweet young lady. Nicest person you'll ever want to meet. On the floor, though, she's, she's a beast. And I was really proud and happy for her when they chose her to be the captain because there are other girls who have more experience. Um, but to me, that tells me that... Team Hood and Sony Women's is also looking to the future. Yeah. What I what I did notice about the whole women's league WMSL, and I talked to Ron Elijah about it. A lot of these girls on these teams are very young, and like the attack, for example, mm-hmm. some of our girls, they're a little older, but they're still out there busting their ass, and they're still competitive. And they're not getting paid even when they play. They play for the love of the game, right? Like, yeah, you know. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, it's cool. The one thing I was just thinking the other day about was how women's the women's field, like World Games, and then men's field World Games, they're two different summers. Where this time, this was like the first time of seeing it all together right mm-hmm. for the box. So, mm-hmm. And that was cool too. Even the Hunter and different. I don't know if it's some of the other organizations have done it too, like the dual post on Instagram, right? Like they're posting the guys and the girls same time, right? Mm-hmm. Giving each mm-hmm. of them the dual respect. Yeah, or the or the girls on the Sony social media will post about the guys and yeah. vice versa. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They're Very out there cool. supporting each other, and that's that's awesome. I, I I wish I could get out there, but um, I'm probably going to go over to Chris's and watch the games. Yeah. <laughs> One thing, too, is like a lot of those girls were saying how they always got hand-me-downs or never got mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. the newest stuff. So they a lot of them, I know, were really pumped to get the new sticks, the gloves, the helmets, you know. So I'm sure things, if they're not wearing them in the summertime next year, but things that at least go on the mantle of something mm-hmm. they'll be proud of having. So when I mentioned earlier, I went out and watched Team Australia versus the uh, ALL All-Star team. Mm-hmm. I actually got the times mixed up, went out there early, went out there for a 5 o'clock game. They didn't play till 7. So the 5 o'clock game, or 4 or whatever, was Team Australia women's team playing against, I think it was the BP Lawyers. And Team Australia, I was reminded because I saw a social media post with one of their goalies, full head of gray hair, she's 52 years old. Yeah, I, was like, yeah, I, see, I seen that too. I was like, ooh. And she was good. She was good. And well, she was straight, so. up from, for, straight up from Australia yeah. too, right? Because they definitely do have, like I know with their winners, like sometimes people would uh, kind of like uh, work or university stuff, they would go over in the summertime. So it would be a North American summer, their winner, and then they'd play th- – field lacrosse and mm-hmm. then I know it's like they've definitely been trying to grow the box game mm-hmm. and Australia they're in the semis tonight for women's versus USA so yeah like they they beat the B, the BP lawyers by one that game and then the next day they played the women's arena lacrosse league all-stars mm-hmm. and beat them like 16-7 so that 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 Australian team for the women well men too like they're the real deal 
I watched that men's team and that guy with the big beard you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I think he had like five or six goals. Yeah, he was a good rate. Yeah, he was pretty solid. And like you said too, with look, obviously Australia being so far away, those guys don't come over here as much and play in like some colleges and mm-hmm. stuff. Sometimes you see stuff, but like I think they got their own stuff growing there, and that's probably why they're one of the only homegrown, fully homegrown teams. I'd say they do recruit f- from North America for players though. Uh, yeah, Brantford boy Cole Robillard went over there to play and played field lacrosse too. Mm-hmm. So I know that they there's guys from here that do go play. Yeah. But um yeah, Australia's a real deal. And uh mm-hmm. Ireland they still there's still that connection with the Haudenosaunee team in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Ireland is probably one of a few teams that understand I won't say know the connection because everybody knows the connection mm-hmm. between Haudenosaunee and, and lacrosse as a mm-hmm. sport. Mm-hmm. Ireland is probably one of the few that understand it. And it makes me laugh very sarcastically that there's probably a lot of other teams from across the ocean that understand the connection where teams right here have no clue. Yeah, they want to take the ownership, right? Uh Like I said, I saw a shirt that said, Team Ontario, you may, have, you may have created it, but we perfected it. There was a lot of cool stuff. Uh, Kevin Sandy. Team Sand- Ontario. And, it, and Team Ontario created it? Kevin uh, Sandy and uh, Karen Bomberry posted a lot of cool stuff, uh, different Chiefs things and mm-hmm. hooding mm-hmm. showing me things. And she's like, this is going to the Czech Republic. This is going to England. And like how happy those people were in those pictures to buy that merch that said stuff on it and had it on. And mm-hmm. they were so happy to bring it back to their continent and country. Mm-hmm. So I do got some questions. Um, before uh, this morning, I actually put it out to Instagram and start put it out there for anyone to ask some questions. So I have some questions, and, spe- and uh, since we're talking about uh, players from overseas, this question is from Stu Hill. He said, "Why hasn't the NLL started drafting players from across across the seas, Europe players?" Well, um, I can't speak for the NLL, but from my personal opinion, is um, and um, I won't speak for Chris, but I'll kind of preload into it if the nll needs scout needs scouts to go to europe i mean i know a few guys that are yeah. available oh we'll there tri- we go there we we'll go. take a trip and like i said the the only guy i don't know if he's the only ever guy from europe was the uh joke joe kim miller he was he had a little trial with the stealth and he did make the wings in 2019 i don't know if he played the full season but he did play six games i kind of had a, i'm not gonna lie i did look that up again i remembered him and i know he's still on the finland team tracy kaluski at the time it was a big thing was he's the finnish coach peterborough guy was the wings assistants kind of got him the look and he did get in there but i don't know why he never played at anything else after those six games in 2019 but like you said, like Czech Republic, they play so much lacrosse and just all those European hockey players and, mm-hmm. you know, Europe, like, you know, all the French guys were getting drafted, three guys in the first round of the NBA, like sports and things are definitely growing over there. So you think there would be more? How, um, how, like, what is the scene like for lacrosse in Europe? Like, it, is, is there, is there a demand for it? Is North America like the spot for lacrosse or is there other like uh, countries like I, doing I definitely things? think North America is kind of where they want to get to. Like, it looked like Last year, there were Czech Republic guys trying out for Burlington and Hamilton, and the guy, the two kids ended up playing for Brantford C. And this year, I guess this kid that was 17, I was actually asking Nick Thomas yesterday, he said he was pretty sure the kid 17 years old that was his teammate for Cambridge is playing Czech Republic. So that kid came over here from Czech and then played the whole uh, summer junior B for Cambridge. But, I mean... It looks like a lot of tournaments. Like I always like a lot of tournaments and stuff. Lacrosse is getting bigger there. Besides the worlds, there's the European box. So they do field and the Euros for uh, box as well. So like all those countries in Israel, they they do get together in those off years of world games and kind of compete. And the even too for NLL, I was just like I knew Gordon Purdy offhand. Australia played NLL for the Saints. Just won a national championship again as the head coach for Adelphi. And Wes Green, he only played one year stealth. So I don't know some of these guys too. They, he went to Adelphi. He played uh, San Jose stealth. This is years ago. L.A. Riptide and uh, Long Island Lizards and MLL. I know at one point this is back before social media was blown up. Supposedly Wes Green threw a guy through a bar lobby <laughs> in a hotel. So I don't know if that kind of ended his North American dream kind of early. His North yeah. American dream. <laughs> but, but I was like, I, he was, like, I know for sure, two Australia guys, but not Europe. It's their own continent. And then 
the guy Miller, but like, yeah, like you think some Czech guys and maybe even some of these guys from Italy or Ireland, like some of these guys, maybe that guy from Australia, he was pretty good. And like, you know, like, and maybe too, it's not paying like those NHL and NBA contracts, but hey, you think some of those guys would maybe, you know, fill out an NL or Austin. Well, look at, look at Koichi. His goal is to become the first Japanese NLL mm -hmm. player. Um, I'm pretty sure he's been over here long enough. He, I'm pretty sure he has a taste of what the pay scale is, but he, we also see how much effort you have to put in because the the guy is in the gym every every day. But is that what they are chasing? Is the dollars, mm -hmm. or do they just want to fulfill a dream like Koichi? Yeah. So again, any team watching. If you need an NLL scout to go to, scout to go to Europe, I can book some time One off. One thing too, following Kochi on social media, I noticed he's been back in Japan and he's like, I, I mean, Japan must be a big country. He's flying all over the place and you see him coaching kids and coaching. It looks like either high school or college kids, and he's drawing in the dirt. So at least, at he's least he's at least at least, at least he's taking what he learned here and he's bringing it back. Because like I told yeah. him once before, I'm like. The, there's only going to be a time when there's not going to be any North American guys in these other countries because that grandfather rule is eventually going to run out. So, like, those countries themselves have to build the wait, 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 wait. What grandfather rule? So, pretty much, it's like if you're like, I was great grandparents, so I can't play for Italy or Ireland. But if it was my great, if my grandparents, like first grandparents, were from Ireland or from Italy, I could have played for those teams because you can be like those kind of non passport holders or kind of that's kind of how they get you on so that's why there's so many north american guys on this team when you're like oh it's like i'm looking and i was like oh there's all these long island guys. there's i was looking at a bunch of rosters of the count of like eight long island guys how many guys were the italy goalies from mississauga there was a couple of guys that played G senior c toronto so lightning like, are you referring to like you know how like you're like uh they'll be like oh well, like I'm, I'm first generation uh like my my like uh my father came from Italy so like that would make me first generation or like my grandfather so like my father's first generation I'm second generation yeah, is that yeah. what you're referring to yeah so it's like so it's like if you're like if you're living in North America but you kind of have those ties that's how you kind of get over yeah. there but they like even back in the day I was talking they were like is your grandfather or grandma and I met my grandma she was right off the boat from Ireland and I, oh no, she's just great. Damn, <laughs> she's my great grandma, not my first grandma. So. Yeah, so literally grandfathered in. If you have at least grandparents that are from a certain country, you can play for that country. In 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 the world's for lacrosse. There was a thing. Uh, so this was 2014. Was right after the World Fields. Somehow I got this wasn't a real fully sanctioned event, but we played the Philippines. And Israel down in New Jersey, me and my buddy Mike Kelly at the time, and uh, uh, I was coaching with the guy that was running the Philippines team, Justin, and he's like, "Hey, my buddy's trying to put together Greece lacrosse. He needs a couple of players. Some you want to come play?" And I was like, "I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm down." And then uh, I asked my buddy Mike. He ends up. It was pretty good. He goes, "Hey, I know my buddy Pete's. Uh, my buddy Pete's uh, friend from his hometown is actually." Uh, He's Greek. He, his his dad was from Greek and immigrated to New York. So like his dad was, his parents were so happy that he was gonna get a chance to play for this Greece lacrosse team on this like random Saturday in August <laughs> in like 2014. That the mom was like, "I'll drive uh, your friend Mike and Chris down there." And I was like, "Oh, okay, sweet." So we got a free ride to Jersey for the day, and and that was really fun. And we got to play. And like we just, I guess the guy. It's. I had the nice Nike stuff, but too bad I didn't say grease on it. So the guy was like, "Hey, you just have it for free." The printing place messed up. And then, uh, so like, you're Italian, grease. right? Yeah. Yes. I always think it's cool. And sorry, this doesn't really look cross, mm -hmm. but like, um, how in America, they'll be like Italian specifically. They'll be like, "Oh, I'm not American. I'm Italian." Mm -hmm. And like, it, to them, it's something different. Or like, oh no, no, actually no. They'll be like, "I'm not white. I'm Italian." Mm -hmm. Like, is that is, is that a, is that a real thing? Because I've heard I've heard that like yeah, yeah I like, guess like so. Italian, it's Italian is different than American. And I think too different than the, being the, just being white or like something. Like you said, the cultural is just kind of where you're like your grandparents are from, kind of thing, and that's kind of like your heritage of like, oh, you grew up in this area, and you know, like you see things on TV and it is real. <laughs> right? yeah, so, yeah, like, yeah. so we all have crazy grandmas, and like if you watch Everybody Loves Raymond, like my grandma had the the uh, plastic over the couch you were never allowed to sit on so why did it have plastic on it because you couldn't sit on it anyways so right? you're Italian <laughs> was, was, was growing up anything like Jersey Shore <laughs> no, no 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 but we didn't know that I did uh, I did see the God so the Gaudis like there was growing up Gaudis back in the day I did see them at the mall and the uh, the youngest Gaudi was supposedly always supposed to play lacrosse St. Dominic's 
terrible lacrosse team. They were in Catholic League C. I end up happening to go there early. Like Jay, just you know, loving lax and going early, and I end up watching them play St. Mary's. I'm like, that God, he's not even on this team. <laughs> and then next thing you know, he's there for the. He's end up sitting in front of me. His hair was a little spiked up then, and then uh, he has ended up watching Shaman St. Anthony's was the better matchup. Where a lot of Tommy Schreiber and all those guys, big name guys, go to that. Those two Catholic schools. One's all boys school. I wouldn't want to go there. And the St. Anthony's was kind of <laughs> had is your half and half. They got guys and girls. So that's crazy. A little, little bit of history for us. I see. I don't. I'm learning. I'm learning. Here. You see, but it's, see, it's cool though. If, if Chris, if Chris was to say, "I'm not American. I'm Italian," it'd be cool. Yeah, I would be like, "Cool, man." <laughs> but, I tried to get on team. I got the so when the was it the twenty the U nineteen worlds I believe mm -hmm. was in was it in Oshawa, Justin Warner I'll give him a shout out I gave him twenty bucks he happened to be like going over there to watch, and he came back with uh, Italy lacrosse and it was like uh, run faster for pasta I still got that shirt I'll wear it next <laughs> run podcast. Faster for pasta. <laughs> That's the thing if Chris says I'm I'm not American I'm Italian everybody okay cool yeah. now if I say I'm not Canadian I'm Mohawk. Everybody just says, shut the hell up. <laughs> oh, no, I think I think nowadays people are just like, yeah, like Native American is not Canadian. And if you think it Me, is, to your face. if you think it is, it is not. <laughs> to your face. It, well, hey, <laughs> you keep your comments to yourself, then, like, sovereign, I don't want to hear that. Sovereign nation and sovereign lands, right? So, yeah, like, no. Well, that's why we're pushing to be recognized as a nation, to mm -hmm. complete, compete in the Olympics. Yeah. Oh, full circle. Full and honestly, circle. how cool would that be? Because it would be a new country, pretty much, in the Olympics, right? Mm -hmm. So Yeah. And I also have some more questions. Oh, this one's going to get deep. So we had, we, we've had a lot of people reach out to us. And uh, this question was actually like a, more of a story, but like I'm not going to put the whole thing out there. I, I can see that scroll. It's probably... Yeah, this, <laughs> uh, this, this person's very passionate, and he, uh, he respected the fact that I... Uh, um, returned his message and I said that we'll actually talk about this but he wanted to talk about like um, why lacrosse doesn't work for some people he said that he wasn't accepted into lacrosse because he started late uh, this person said that um, he was kind of a quiet guy he, and he basically goes on to say that you know he was into BMX and skateboarding and uh, you know uh, off-road truck racing and that most people in his community were into like hip-hop and country and trying to be gangster and he was into like rock and stuff so essentially what he's saying was that he didn't fit in and uh, I know that that's a big thing within lacrosse is just that like what you like um, off the floor really does affect if people will like you in the dressing room mm -hmm. um, and then if people don't like you in the dressing room they're not going to want you on the team so for this um, individual from what it sounds like, it just, yeah, the things that he was interested interested in, other people weren't, and it deteriorated him from playing lacrosse. So my question to you guys is, like, what do players need to do to stay within lacrosse when they actually don't get along with any of the people, but they want to play because they're passionate about it, but from what this person explained was there's this too much ego too much ego in lacrosse, too much people who want to be center of attention and a lot of, uh, um, too much testosterone, let's just say. First thing I want to know is where was he trying to play? He is from Ganawage. Okay. And he is Mohawk, so he um, identified that and, mm -hmm. uh, but he just basically said that his upbringing was completely different. You know, he was into like BMX, skateboarding. Mm -hmm. Everyone else was into hip hop and country music and going out. So and all these different things. Just from that little bit that you're telling me right off the hop, he was into individual sports. Yeah, he said he was a quiet guy. Like, I'm not going to put this on him because he was into individual sports. Maybe he had to go into individual sports because he couldn't fit in with a team. It happens. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to put anything on him. Um, don't know what, don't know what year this, what years this happened. Don't know who was coaching. Don't know anything. Don't know any of that. Um, as a coach, I think you should identify why is this kid quiet? Why is he not accepted and find out that's what, to me, that's what I, I, I've tried it in the past. And there's been times when I've totally missed it. I've had players quit on me before, for those similar reasons. And I didn't see it. That's on me. I can, I can own that. But there's also been a lot of times where I've seen players quiet, sitting by themselves in a dress room, nobody talking to them or picking on them the whole while. 
and have made them the teaching tool, so to speak. So I won't say teacher's pet, but I paid a little more attention to them, gave them a little more praise, a little extra time when it came to coaching some or trying to teach something. So, you know, I'd be like, okay, do that again. And I'd say, if you can do it five times, practice is over. So then everybody's cheering for him. Okay. And I, there, I remember one young man in winter league lacrosse. Um, crazy, crazy attitude on this kid, hilarious, but he was funny, so people would like him. And he went all year, and we, I would even say, nobody leaves the floor until this guy scores at, at practice. During games, we knew he was brand new. It was hard enough to try to focus. I had 30 kids out there. Hard enough to focus on him and try to get him in more involved, but the kid scored the game-winning goal in overtime, the last game of the season. And they basically hoisted him up on their shoulders. Everybody was so happy for him. So it took all of that to get him in more involved, to, to learn learn the game a little better, to make actual friends who he didn't have to just be funny around for them to like him. Um, and to me, that that's a feel-good story. I, I, I felt good for that young man because he blossomed after that. Um, but that's what I pick up is maybe who, coach should have identified that right off the hop. Because um, he did go on to say that basically he stopped playing like um, after uh, uh, he said senior C. Yeah, I think it was senior C. I no junior C. He got to junior C and then he just said that like he just didn't want anything more of it. He loves the game and wanted to play, but it just basically, yeah, he didn't like the the way that other he, from from what he said, was just that there was too much ego. Yeah, I get but that. But like even myself growing up, I could identify there was a lot of ego. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of like, hey, like as good as some players are, that ego is going to be the one that ruins their career. Well, and again, small community. Let's use high school football in Texas as a mm -hmm. prime example. If you're a small town and you're the quarterback, you're you get, the star of the yeah. town. Get away with murder, ain't so. So if you're in a small town, like we're, we, we have a small community here. Gunnawagi is even smaller. So if you're a lacrosse player in these communities, and you're a good lacrosse player, people stroke your ego. I've seen it. I've seen junior kids who are pretty, pretty elite players all hang out together, go to, go to a restaurant here in the community and get to eat for free because they are who they are. So then there's an expectation that comes with that now. Now I can go to this restaurant and eat for free. It's expected. That's just an example. I've seen it. So is is that like that in Gunawagi? They're a smaller community? I don't know. So what do you feel that like, um, like there's nothing that even really a coach can like kind of do to bring a player back down to earth. Like if a player is good and a player excels and a player, you know, has like, but still like. like cut them. Yes, you, you can cut the player and then you can make the team kind of suffer because that player does bring value. It's just that maybe that player's got too much of a big ego or too, like they just can't like, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know why people get the egos, but like you don't want to cut the player because the rest of the team's going to suffer because that player is actually good. Or are they going to grow because the cancer's gone? They could, but like what would you, what could a coach do or what could the team do to kind of be like, hey man, like you kind of, you're kind of letting yourself go. like. You know, you used to be cool until that, like, uh, you know, now it's just gone too far. It's gone to your head or something like that. Because I feel like in the community, like, a team should be able to come to their captain when or some, to whoever. When some guys are just getting, like, especially at certain ages, like, too big for their ego, is that going to affect them later on in life where they think, oh, I'm bigger than the law and I'm bigger. I don't, I don't got to get in trouble. I scored three goals last night. But it's like, oh, you broke the law or you did this and, you know, things happen then – like Jay said, do you cut them or do you, you know, do you even scare them and do you kick them off, right? There was a thing years ago of, I know the the Bantam team kicked a kid off the team, but then the next weekend he went to qualifiers with the midget team. And the coach for the Bantam team was like, oh, I was trying to teach this guy a lesson. But then the midget team liked him because he was a good player and yeah. scooped him up. So it's, again, small, small community politics. Um, 
I've seen it a lot down here. Ego's ego has gone wild. Um, for the most, uh, and I've I've went I've said to players before, if you don't smarten up, I'm going to cut you. And then I then their parents get involved. Why are you going to cut my kid? So re in the reality of it is, is it the coach's spot to deal with it, especially if parents get involved, yeah. or is it the parent who maybe let their kid go too? The one time a uh, coach was telling me about. He's like, yeah, he's like, this kid, he just wasn't getting it, you know? And his mom said, yeah, he's a good kid. You just got to be tough on him, you know? If you just a little tough on him and then, you know, it'll get through to him. That coach started being tough on him and the mom told the kid, you don't got to listen to him, he's not your dad. <laughs> and, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and that coach was like, what? You just told me to yeah. be hard on your kid. Well, and and back kid me up, you know? me. Yeah. Around Bantam age, my own, my own kid went through it where he was mm -hmm. really cocky and arrogant. And I had to tell him, I'll pull you off the team myself. Mm-hmm. Because we were getting calls from school, he did this, or he's mm -hmm. picking on this, or he's a bully, and f thankfully he came to his senses quite quite early and quite young, and was and is pretty humble now. But um, I mean, that's on him. I didn't do that. That's on him. He grew into a pretty pretty decent human being, mm -hmm. but he also had an ego problem when he was fourteen, fifteen, and I was getting calls from the school about it. See, he didn't know that. <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, but yeah, exactly. Like the schools too, because you think about it, if you're the number one player on on the field, or uh, number one player on the floor, have a great weekend. You go out there, score three, four goals. You come back on the Monday, and you're like, oh yeah, you know, I'm the, I'm the shit. My my teacher can't tell me nothing. My principal's giving me a pound when I'm walking through the hallway saying good game. Like, at, how do you bring them back down to earth? Because, like, yeah, that's that's just like my main question is because I notice within the community sometimes that's a thing, and it starts young. It starts with the, like, it could even be as something as like, um, like you see, you see some of these young kids and then their their older brothers or something like that are big big players, and yeah, they're looking up to their big brother and they 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 they're probably like, oh yeah, they're amazing, they're great, and yeah, they probably are amazing and great, but like, even the young kids think they can get away with what their big brothers are doing mm -hmm. because they see their big brothers so it's just like even for the like the players like you gotta you set an example for these kids i think at a young age it's on the parents if you don't nip it in the bud and being a parent yeah i'll, I, I'll own that too some of the things my kids have did are a direct result because of my teaching or lack of but egos don't develop overnight they take a little while to to fester is it part of the sport? Is it part partly on the parents? Is it partly on the coach? It's all three. But if somebody's had an ego for years, that should have been noticed at home. The many phone calls from a school should have been mm -hmm. a red flag. The many phone calls from wherever should have been a red flag. I'm not saying that this happened to this in this particular incident. With, oh no! This with, guy, this guy, yeah. this guy's grown at this point. No, but talking. I mean the the yeah. kids that didn't accept him or whatever. I don't know if all that happened with these with these teammates. But if if you make it to junior, and you have an ego, that should have been nipped in the bud at home. I'd say to this guy, like you said, he is older and he did, does like lacrosse a lot. Maybe branch out and try to. Hopefully, there is some other leagues, or maybe you'll you'll find some other guys down Bingo. the road that you that you do mesh with, and then you can keep playing the game you love. Bingo! Come on down here. There's a lot of teams to travel for. Yeah, because yeah, like I even know people in this community who want to get back into lacrosse just because we're talking about lacrosse. Because now there's social media. Everyone's mm -hmm. get like you know whether you make it pro or not, you can get a little bit of notoriety. Might get a might get a job, make a few bucks, do whatever it is. Like there's opportunities out there now with social media and like lacrosse is huge on Six Nations so more people want to get back into it but some of them are already so discouraged of like oh I used to play back in the day and I had to deal with this now I'm gonna have to like people still think that uh I don't know what's the what's the word that that ego again I think some guys just uh maybe think too much where it's like hey I haven't played lacrosse in 15 years and I heard I'm gonna get back in shape and I'm gonna go out for the Riverman they, and I was, yeah, and, I've heard it. And, and you know, this is not just a bush league team. They go to the President's Cup every year, and one 
two national championships start off maybe Thursday nights, Sundays, you know, maybe a pickup thing. Like you got to kind of slow yourself back into it. You haven't played since Bantam. I don't think you're going to just make this the top team in Ontario right off the kick. Even, even with the, the, the Warriors, like, cause again, I was pl playing, I was there like when they were practicing uh, in the beginning and I seen some of the players go out and yeah, I seen some of them when some of, some of the players that I used to play with back in the day and uh, like they, they went out and, uh, you know, the last couple practices. But you could see who the ones who were going to keep going. But even some of the ones who wanted to get back out there, you know, I'm sure in their mind, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get on the Warriors. Mm -hmm. And then they, they didn't get there because those Warriors were still very talented. Yeah. There's so Compared much talent team, yeah. on this reserve that, like, you got to, like, just, just go out to Chicky League, start there, and figure it out where you want to go. I think what was cool was that Nations Cup years ago. Was that 2018 when other reserves were... Were they scared or did they back out last minute? And then there ended up being a few free agent teams. And then that ILA was packed, but it was like everybody's friends and family locally because then there ended up being like six of the eight teams were local. Well, Nations Cup a few years back, um, team from Six Nations here was told they weren't allowed to play because they were too good. Which one was that one? Aces. Or was it the Stallions? Same, same, Stallions. same group yeah, of players. Yeah. Probably, I'd say it was the same group of players. The 18 one, the Aces, it must have been a one before that one. But like but, you said, the same guys, they were they were too good or even like last year. Uh, is there even a Nations Cup this year? I know they brought it back. And last year was like Canadian Thanksgiving weekend and Onondaga had five teams from it. But down below went down and won. <laughs> so ru rumor, like, rumor is Nations Cup is going to be the same weekend as Laxley. Mm -hmm. So and it's who's organized? Who who is does organize? Something tells me that's perfect timing for whoever's organizing because yeah. then okay, all the all these good players are gone to Lax mm -hmm. Let's have the Nations Cup. Let's put in our stack team. Nobody can beat us. Mm -hmm. Make it an even playing field. Have it on a neutral weekend. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, we got more questions. We had a lot of questions. Uh, this one. Said uh, would be very interesting what you guys think about um, how NLL teams now are drafting more field players who didn't even play box at all. I was like kind of looking at uh, John Lintz was kind of mad, uh, not mad, but on Twitter he posted all of his junior A players from Edmonton Miners that didn't get drafted. And he's like, hey, these guys had good junior careers in Canada lacrosse, and you're drafting some field guys that may not even show up to your training camp. My question is, are these field players predominantly U.S. players? Some of them seem to be. Yeah, I was like some some different random schools or kind of like because this I, long pole here. And I know the NLL has a stipulation where they have to have X amount of U.S. players in the league. And like I said, yeah, I can definitely see that, and because uh, it's different too. If like let's say a Brett Manny, or there has been like some guys that never played box, and then they go out and they make the NL and do good. So I don't want to discourage that, but and then there's few guys. There was one guy they kind of had him posted at his as his uh, the U.S. box team he played for in like those leagues in the states, but he really was from Canada and finished off playing the Minto Cup champion Burlington last year. I'm like, I think playing for Burlington is what got him in the NL and not for playing in the league this year. It probably kept him going in shape-wise, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. like you said there, yeah, there was just a lot of, like you said, a lot of good players from here or other places do get left off because then like a guy, a random guy that's not on maybe Steven Stamps draft board or swarmedup.com ends up kind of making it. And sometimes they don't even play Brennan O'Neill. That was a huge thing. He got, he was supposed to play Arrows in a, 2019 and he's like was you in team usa field last year and he's been on the u21 field long island guy committed to penn state in eighth grade bayshore high school public school then he decides varsity he, as an eighth grader but he transfers to st anthony's a predominantly catholic school and like you said tommy schreiber and stuff he was drafted number one overall was like the first american since casey powell back in the day and was one of a handful of lyle thompson kevin crowley and some other guys that got drafted in pro field number one and nll number one there's yeah. some stuff saying of paul rebel not like wanting to be the only pro league Right, how he doesn't let guys play in season PLL stuff, and then is he telling guys, "Hey, I'll give you a little extra money if you sit out the NLL season." He doesn't want to see a star get hurt. So I know a lot of mock drafts had Brendan O'Neill going number one, and obviously he got picked. Philly talked to him. He just signed a. It was announced he signed a three-year three deal year. with Philly today. So it's good to see a guy, and like they said, he he's a big guy. They and Dyson Williams who. 
number one all pick last year was his uh, Sean Williams' son. He's going to play for Albany. Going to be a big help for Albany this year. Dyson Williams, he was like, Brandon O'Neill's going to have no problem playing in the NLL and box across. So he didn't end up coming to Canada and playing like a Joey Spelina did, who maybe he maybe he could be a number one pick someday and be another American. And It's just showing at least the box game's growing and lacrosse in general is growing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... Um yeah, I think the the like the field players, uh, like I've I've read some of the, the comments um, because uh, there's this another page that I follow, mm-hmm. and I try to I try to get some of my info from them. They seem pretty pretty on their on their stuff there, um, but they're saying that like field nowadays is boring, like just boring. It it definitely is because like field across, you know, you're a long player attack when you're sitting down there shooting the shit. Well, hey, how's it going? You know, this and that. I had I'll tell you a story when we played Finger Lakes Community College. I won't say his name. The one guy we were kind of killing the team. He. Uh, the one, def- one defender kept talking to the attackman, and that attackman scored three goals on him, and our coach yanked him and put me in. I like to talk, and that same attackman tried to talk to me. I was like, fuck, no, I'm not talking to you. Yeah, I, I knew that time. I was like, I was like, Coach Catani already pulled uh, number six off the field. I'm not getting pulled off for talking to this guy. He's not psyching me out the game trying to <laughs> chit-chat. <laughs> like, and then, But you can't chit-chat in box across, right? It's, you know, you're... You can chirp, though. Yeah, you can chirp. You can chirp, <laughs> but definitely, especially the bench. But, like, you know, it's too fast pace. You're on, you're off. You know, you don't have that down time like you do in field lacrosse and i think even in there's talks of world field them putting a shot clock in world field because last year right those teams just held the ball they could hold it all game if they wanted to they didn't mm-hmm. have to give it up mm-hmm. all right well we have to get out of here it is almost seven o'clock there's about to be a uh Haudenosaunee Nationals are playing uh, America, right? 7 o'clock. And then yep. 8.30 is going to be Haudenosaunee and uh, Team Canada, but the women's. Yep, so two good games on TSN Plus and ESPN Plus. Uh, make your predictions real quick. No I predictions? No hurt feelings. No hurt feelings. Haudenosaunee all the way. That's I, all I, think, I know. I think this USA Haudenosaunee team is going to be a good game, though. I could see it being a one-goal game either oh, way. All right, with Haudenosaunee all the way. That's episode 13 of the Creators Game Podcast. Until next week, we're out of here. Peace.